You would open up your Bibles tonight, Romans chapter 13. Paul now continues in this applicational section that really kind of forms the backbone uh, of all society. He's talked about civil government, we covered that last week, and now he shifts to this incredible thought process of the debt that we have to love one another. Sometimes people will ask me, you know, well, well, what's the main thing? They'll ask, you know, is it just the gospel? Is it just the word of God being effectively taught? If you were to try and define what the main thing is in all of Scripture, the Bible says in and of itself, the main thing is love. God is actually love. John codifies that in his letters, and he goes so far as to say God is love. So if we're going to emulate God, if we're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, then the supreme thing is love. You see, because you can correct in love, you can teach truth in love, you can respond to people in this world in love. You can uphold the Word of God in love. You can read in love. You can pray in love. You can do anything and everything in love. But if you take that love out of those things, oh, you can absolutely correct without love, and you can absolutely destroy somebody. You can be 100% right, you can have all the facts correct, and you can absolutely, even though you're speaking 100% truth, be completely out of the will of God. Any of you who are parents in here, you know this is true. We can have our facts correct, but the way that we administer those facts in raising our children determines whether it's used for the Lord or by the enemy. And so we have a debt in that sense of love. There's three verses tonight, verses 8 through 10, and would you join me and let's pray as we start our time in the Word. Father, we again are indebted to you in love. We thank you that you first loved us. We thank you that because you have loved us, you sent Jesus in the first place. Because you, Jesus, loved us with an everlasting love, you died on Calvary's cross. And because of that first love, we can now love you. And so, Lord, we pray this debt of love would become visible to us tonight, that you'd speak it into our lives as truth, and that we would keep the main thing the main thing. Lord, your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so he establishes human government, civil government, the role of government, which we all can say we have struggles with from time to time, for whatever reason. And he goes on to say in verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. And while that seems very simple, and it is, it is also extremely complex because love is not just simply an additive to everything. It's the motivator. It's the instigator. It is the thing that empowers. Love becomes, in essence, the, the life stream of all things Christ-like, of all things Christian. Owe oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. People often struggle with the role between the law of God and the grace of God, the law of God and the love of God, the law of God, the holiness of God, and our sin-filled natures. Amen? If you don't struggle with that, we need to talk. Because you actually do struggle with it, because you're still a sinner that's simply saved. You're not perfected, 
You are being perfected. You're not complete. You're being completed. You're not sinless. You sin less. You understand? You see, love is the thing that drives that. But the law of God, the moral requirements of God, have not ever changed. God is still 100% holy. God still has some rules and regulations that we're supposed to follow. But we no longer follow those things out of fear. We follow the law of God out of the love of God. And so the love of God becomes the prime directive in our lives. It's what motivates us to, to do the things that God asks. becomes very clear here. For the commandments, and here's a, a, it's such a beautiful passage of Scripture, because these things are tied immediately together. Because most people would go, well, you know, can a person who's a murderer be saved? Yes, they can. A person who's an adulterer be saved? Yes, they can. It's not about keeping the law perfectly that causes you to be a child of God. It's the love of God that prevents you, once you have been saved, from being those things which you once were. It's the love of God that leads men into repentance, and it's the love of God that allows us to live for God. You see, if you're just simply afraid of God, most people are afraid of God when they figure out who He is. Right? Right? You know, if you're going to bump into the supreme being of all the universe, you're going to have a little bit of awe, a little bit of fear. But God doesn't want our relationship with him or with each other guided simply by the fact that he's holy, guided simply by the fact that he's majestic, guided simply by the fact that he's perfect. But those things which we would just simply assign to God because God is God. He wants our lives guided and motivated by one single thing, and it is this debt of love. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, notice this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You want to see it in action? Do you want to lose your husband or your wife to another person? You sure do not. Do you yourself want to be murdered? You sure do not. Do you want all of your stuff stolen? You sure do not. Do you get the picture? So if you really are walking in the love of God, then the things of God are going to be the way you handle yourself because you yourselves have received said same from the Lord. God has been gracious to you. God has been kind to you. God has been loving to you. God has been merciful to you. And so these things that you do not want happening in your family are then directed by the very love that's been placed in your life by Christ. All of a sudden, they're the outflow of your life. I wouldn't steal another person's spouse because God loves me and I love him and I want others to be loved the same way that I am loved. To be any other way is to be disingenuous and a hypocrite. You see, if we want God to fully love us, then we're supposed to treat other people like he does. Like he does. You see how love now motivates us to be law keepers. You see, I actually then look at the Ten Commandments and I go, you know what? I definitely don't want to hurt somebody. I don't want to murder them. I don't want to steal what they have. I don't want to even covet what they have because if I covet it, I might take it. Because God's been good to me. Love becomes the motivating factor behind us keeping the, the, the rules, if you will, that God has laid down for His holiness. For love does no harm to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, when Jesus remarked about this very thing, 
And if you want to turn there, you can go to John 13. We'll get there in a while in our study on Sunday mornings. But John 13 lays down this truth from a slightly different angle. And in verse 31, it says, So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer, and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. And so now I say to you, notice what Jesus is saying. This is the prime directive given by Jesus. He's about to be crucified and ascend into heaven. And this is what he tells them. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, and by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Do you see the prime directive there? You see some things missing. I always like to look at these passages from what's not there. You are my disciples indeed if you are theologically accurate about the things of the last days. You are my disciples indeed if you have at least 50 memory verses. You are my disciples indeed if you have gone to church for at least eight and a half years. You are my disciples indeed if you've ever gone on a mission trip. You are my disciples indeed if you've been giving faithfully to the Lord. No, he says, here's my new commandment to you. Where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm going to heaven. You're still alive. You need to stay here. But the commandment I want you to remember when I leave is you must love one another. And oh, by the way, in case you missed it, he does it three times, and he says... All men need to be loved. He lays out the prime directive. This debt, this is the debt that we now have. You see, if we really love someone, then we won't sin against them. And in essence, we now do not live under the weight of the law. We live under the freedom of grace that expresses itself in love. I don't live under the weight of the law. I don't wander around going, oh, you know, I wonder if this is against God's law. Because I can solve almost everything by saying, is this really loving someone the way Jesus loves them? You see, almost everything that God's given us as a command that we ought to be because he's holy can be defined by, is it loving or is it not loving according to God's standard? You're not going to become a drunk because you would be unloving to your family. You'd be unloving to those that are driving on the roads while you're driving. You're not going to steal other people's stuff because it's completely unloving to take their things. You see what happens when you start to look at everything? Would this be Christ's love born out in that person's life? This is a debt that we owe that we will spend the rest of our days while we're still on this earth attempting to pay. You see, sin there in Romans 6 should not have dominion over us anymore because that sin's been taken care of. The price has been paid. Some people take this verse and they apply it, especially verse 8, to debt, actual debt, money. And I want to tell you that not only does the Bible not forbid the borrowing of money, Jesus himself actually uses it a couple of times as an example, uh, saying that there should be some interest that's gained from it while you're doing something here on this earth. But the point is, is he's not talking about money. But with regard to the biblical stand on this particular issue, in case you're one of those people that thinks that's where this applies, what the Bible does forbid is charging exorbitant rates of interest. What the Bible does forbid is charging poor people so that they will become poorer. What the Bible does forbid is our basic financial system that we have in place in our country. 
And so you need to be very careful about how you utilize the financial system that we have in this country. Because in many ways, and in many cases, it is not of the Lord. Because the basic principle there of Proverbs 22 is very clear. While it is not inherently wrong to borrow money, the moment you borrow money, you become a servant to the lender. The King James actually says you become a slave. Not just a household servant, but an indentured servant to the lender. Now has power over you, authority over you. The rich, it says, rules over the poor. And so we want to avoid that type of an arrangement in our lives. We want to be very careful about uh, incurring debt. We want to be extremely careful about what we do with our finances because they belong to the Lord. The money in your bank account actually does not belong to you. It belongs to God. He's loaned it to you. And so you want to be careful how you handle it. You also want to be careful about what you do with it when you're dealing with people who have need. I can tell you there are a whole bunch of things that go on in our world that God is not happy about. And one of them is rich people taking advantage of poor people. And God sees every last bit of it. And he is the one that will repay. His word is clear, this is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. But for us, we need to do it differently. We need to do it the Lord's way. All these things are much easier to talk about than they are to actually do. And so in the handling of your finances, you have to remember that God is watching that too. But that's not the real point here. The real point, the real problem, if you will, is the human heart. The human heart, Scripture is very clear there in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the human heart is deceitful above all things. Now, when you read that, don't forget that he's talking about your heart. He's talking about every human heart. He's not talking about some hearts. He's not talking about unbelievers' hearts. The intent there in the original Hebrew is that every last human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and who can know it? So our problem is a heart problem. And the only answer to that heart problem is a heart exchange. One that's as hard as stone being swapped out for one that's soft and pliable, that's made so by the love of God. You see, when God's love comes into your life and, and your heart begins to change, all of a sudden your motivations are different. That hardness, that human will to stand against the things of God gets knocked down a few notches. And God says, look, those are, you're supposed to be acting as I want you to act, not as you want to act, because you want to act in anger, and you want to act in revenge, and you want to act in bitterness because, as a human being, there's still some resident deceitfulness in there. There's still some resident wickedness in all of us. You know, every once in a while, I will have someone who, who believes somehow, uh, they usually drag out a handful of proof texts, that once you give your life to Jesus, that you're perfect. And I said, does that include the fact that you're arrogant and prideful? <laughs> and they'll look at me, oh, I'm not arrogant, I'm just, I'm just quoting. I said, I said, No. Because you disagree with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said that he was sold under sin after he got saved. And then he went on to say, those things which I will to do, I do not do. But those things which I will not to do, those very things I do, who will deliver me as a believer from this body of death? And he goes on and gives a solution to it. Praise God that in Christ Jesus, I, I have ultimately, he would say in Romans chapter 8, I have been made more than a conqueror through him who loves us. But you see, we're still a work in progress. Amen? Amen. 
But here's what happens. If you really have the love of God in you, then obedience is one of the ways, if not the key way, that you actually show that God's at work in your life. So those things which used to not be part of who you are because your heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked and you do have a sin nature, those things which you used to not even find offensive, because I think most of us can look back on our, our days before we met Jesus and almost all of us without exception would say something to the effect, you know, I really didn't know that the sin that I was doing was all that bad. You may have had a couple of little instances where, wow, that was really a bad time, but most of us, because we were not yet redeemed, didn't even realize that those behaviors that we undertook were all that big of an offense to God. But once you give your life to the Lord, all of a sudden, those things start to show up in your life the way they're supposed to. You're supposed to hate it because it's not like Jesus. And the obedience is a picture that the love of God is actually at work in you. At work in me. And so what happens is Jesus would rightly say, uh, Matthew's gospel, Mark's, all the gospels paint the same picture. Jesus was actually underneath loving obedience to his own father. He said, I, my meat is to do the will of the father. These things which I, I will to do His will. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me. You see, the outflow of the love that is Christ Jesus, remember, He is love, that's what Scripture says. The outflow of that is Him doing His Father's will. You see, it would have been very unloving, and let me categorize this for you in a very simple way. Put it into a box that you can see. Can you imagine if Jesus got to Pilate's courtyard and all of a sudden, he began to defend himself with all of the glories of heaven. And he goes through every single sin of every person standing in the courtyard. They're all condemned. They all leave. And then furthermore, when he comes to be beaten, which he needed to be beaten because Isaiah the prophet said that he would, he said, oh no, by the way, I'm God. You're not touching me. And then when the crown of thorns came, which would have pronounced him as the king of something, in this case, Jesus, King of the Jews, he was the promised Messiah. When that, sorry, but no. You see, the will of God the Father that was placed upon him was that Jesus the Son would die on Calvary's cross. And so the outflow of that love was him actually dying, actually being beaten actually being bruised, actually having the crown of thorn placed on his head, eventually actually dying, having a spear stuck in his side. You see, the outflow of love in Jesus was death to himself. Do you follow me? The outflow of the love of God in our lives is the same thing. It's death to self. It's obedience to the Father's will. And so all of the laws... You can see how, well, I'm not going to do that because that's me pleasing me. Death the self says, I'm going to please God the Father. He said, that person's stuff is not mine. I used to tell the kids at the camp all the time, you know, let me help you. Just in case you didn't know, if you have somebody else's stuff, that's what we call stealing. Because sometimes they're like, well, if they just leave it here. You know, they go through all kinds of mental gymnastics. Well, you know, I found it on the ball field. No, if you have someone else's stuff and it's not your stuff, your stuff is your stuff, their stuff is their stuff. If you have their stuff, you've stolen it. But you see, in our deceitful little wicked minds, well, they left it on the ball field. Love, it says, does no harm. So the harm being done is... That was that person's jacket. That was that person's water bottle. That was that person's, you know, 12 pack of monster energy drinks, which I'm kind of glad when kids take those, actually, you know, hopefully they don't drink them. But you see, we have this debt, and this debt is because we've been transformed, we've been renewed, 
we are to follow God, and He is 100% holy, the outflow of that is, I now have a debt to God to be just like Jesus. And you're probably saying, well, I thought my debt was paid. That's absolutely true. Your debt was paid. The debt of your sin. The debt of your sin was paid on Calvary's cross. You see, you had a debt you couldn't pay. The price for that was your own death. And in your place, Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross. So in that sense, the sin debt was paid. But in paying that sin debt, you took upon yourself a different kind of debt. And that is the debt to now love the one who paid it. To take and now live your life for him. To express an attitude of gratitude. We're heading towards Thanksgiving. It's really the backbone of Thanksgiving. When I understand what God has done for me, how can I not be thankful? And so you now have a new kind of debt. It's the debt of love, which results in you having a life that's surrendered to God. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine if we all took that debt very seriously and spent our entire lifetimes attempting, we'll never do it, but attempting to pay back the amount of love that Jesus expressed for you on Calvary's cross. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the effect the church would have in this world if we took that kind of love into everything we do? Everything. Do you think it would solve some of the problems that ail our nation? It would solve poverty, I can tell you that right now. Because if I truly see my brother in need, Scripture says, how can I harden my heart against him? And say that the love of God dwells in me. Do you see how transformational that would be? How could I possibly hate someone because of their skin color? When Christ died for all of us equally. That's my brother. That's my sister. Now, I think probably all of us, we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving. Does anyone else have weird people that come to your house at Thanksgiving? <laughs> They're called family. <laughs> and they do stuff that you're like, oh, you did not just do that. <laughs> but you still love them, right? Why? Because they're family. You see, if we recognize the debt we have to Christ for saving us in the first place, we would love everyone. Everyone. And real love does no harm. Not emotional harm, not physical harm, not financial harm. Love does no harm. Does no harm. You can't fix anger with more anger. You can't fix hate with more hate. But you can fix both of them with love. You see, we have a debt. And we need to work at paying it. It applies first to other believers. It applies to everyone and realistically, that's the, the, the new commandment that Jesus gave. He didn't say, I, I want you to do this and do that or be this and be that. He just simply said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. Truth is, is absolutely essential to understanding what God wants for us. But we even take truth and hold it in love, the book of Ephesians says. Truth is to be spoken in love. When you read that incredible love letter that the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, at the end of it, in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13, what does it say? It says, now abide in faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's some big things. Faith, 
I am saved by grace and through faith. But the Bible says the greatest thing is love. Hope. I live in expectant hope of a glorious return of my king. But the greatest thing is love. You see, if I'm not hoping in love, I don't have faith in love. Paul actually went a long ways to tell us exactly the whole picture. He said, if you could take a stinking mountain and toss it into the sea, if you had that kind of faith, but you don't possess love in doing it, here is a sounding brass. We are indebted to love, folks. It's our prime directive. It's the one thing we all should be getting really good at. You may not be able to teach a Bible study. You may not be an effective evangelist in sharing truth, but let me tell you something. You can find somebody to love. You can love them. For some, it's harder than others, but you can express love. That's the debt that we have. God commands it. He, he, doesn't, he commands it. He, he doesn't say, well, you kind of sort of should be loving if you're my kids. He says, this is how the entire world is actually going to understand with their puny little pea brains that you are my kids if you have love one for another. Not if you agree line by line on every minor doctrine of the faith. Not if every church looks exactly the same. Not if there's uniformity in the body of Christ. Do you understand what I just said? I didn't say unity. Unity isn't essential to the faith. But uniformity means that it all looks the same. There's a lot of different looks to the body of Christ. I was talking last week to a guy who's, who's a pastor of an Anglican church. Now, for me, Anglicans are a little tiny stiff. Just a little bit. But you know, as we sat down and talked, he loved the same Jesus I loved. He, he knows the same doctrines of faith that I know. He's going to heaven because by grace he's been saved through faith. Now, he, he wears a robe and he's even got a scepter. And I, I asked him, I said, so how does that working out for you? And he actually laughed exactly like you just did. Says, well, it kind of comes with a job. <laughs> I had a blast talking to him. All this history of the Anglican church. But you know what? We'd probably disagree on a few things. But man, did he love Jesus. He wants his people to love Jesus. And he preaches the real gospel. Maybe we should focus a little more on the love and a little less on the things that might divide us? You think? You think? I think so. I think that would put a big smile on Jesus' face. Sometimes we get hung up on the wrong things. As you look at this passage and kind of how it goes, it, 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 it sets this defining characteristic and then it kind of points towards some things that realistically ought to def actually define who we are. Some qualities, if you will, if you want to think about it. You see, the debt of love actually causes us to never do anything that would hurt, harm, or stumble someone else. You see, because the debt of love in it, you wouldn't want to do something to them that you would not want done to you. It does no harm. Now, I don't know when you think about harm what you think about. I used to pretty much, when I was younger, just think, can I live through this? That's kind of a guy's worldview when you're, you know, between the ages of about 14 and maybe 30. It's like, I'll do this as long as I don't die. That's not what's being talked about here. Harm is mental harm. 
emotional harm, physical harm, spiritual harm. Love does no harm. So you're not going to cause somebody to go have a drink with you when you know that they are going to stumble with alcohol. You're not going to encourage them, well, hey, you know, we're going to get together and, you know, talk a little bit when you know that they're probably not going to show up at work, so you're going to do financial harm to them. You get it? You see, love does no harm. So stuff starts getting eliminated pretty quickly from your repertoire of action. And all of a sudden, you're like, well, you know, I probably shouldn't do that because I love my brother, I love my sister. It starts to really pencil down the things that matter. It puts into perspective. The debt of love is forgiving. When I think about how much I have been forgiven, what do you think I'm going to do to people who have hurt me? I've got to forgive. So much so that when you read what Scripture has to say about the subject of forgiveness, and whether it's Ephesians 4 or or Matthew chapter 6 or Matthew chapter 18, which is the biggie, if you're a child of God, your debt of love puts you in the place where you need to be a forgiver. I need to be really good at forgiving and very quick at forgiving. Because we've been forgiven much, amen? I have. I'm going to heaven because my sins have been forgiven. Oh man, do I owe a debt of love. That God loved me and has forgiven me. How can I not forgive other people? It's also characterized by humility. There in me dwells no good thing. I try and do good. I try and love. And I think most of the time I do a fair job at being as much like Jesus as I humanly can. But the truth is, I'm not perfect at it. The truth is, I mess up. One of the reasons I'm looking forward to heaven is there's no traffic. (laughs) God personally told me there's no traffic in heaven. Because I could not be in the fullness of joy if there's traffic there. Oh, in humility, I recognize that I, I have to work extra hard when I get behind the wheel. I'm like, Lord, there's too many people on this planet. <laughs> in humility, I recognize, it's like, Lord, I'm sorry. I copped an attitude again. Let me tell you a little secret here. If you don't get when God speaks to you through swat and flies, he's going to make you face eventually the death of the firstborn. So listen when he sends flies your way. He wants to change our attitude. We need to be humbled at times to recognize we really ain't all that, are we? I'm not. I'll just shoot straight with you. I'm not all that. Now, I'm going to be all that one day, completely. Right now, right now, I am an all that work in progress, right? So are you. You have a lot of humility when you recognize that. Aren't you glad, as Paul would write there, uh, again, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Amen? It's not jealous. doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. Yikes. Man, I, I haven't paid that debt of love at times because I haven't been as humble as I should be. Got a little arrogant, got a little puffed up, a little prideful. One of the greatest debts, if not the greatest debt, one of the biggest tests, surely, for us, for this debt that we now have to God, to be loving, to be kind, to be gentle, to have these things that, when you read the fruit of the Spirit, make sure you read it correctly, there in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Everything that follows that in the original text is made possible by the first thing, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Gentleness, meekness, self-control, all the rest of those things are a result of the love of God in you. 
So the fruit of the Spirit is actually a fruit, if you want to look at it that way, with a whole bunch of other little fruits hanging off of it. It's like a cluster of grapes where there's one really big one and a whole bunch of little ones hanging off of it. The fruit of the Spirit is love. But the biggest way you can test your love is to sacrifice yourself. Because we don't like doing that, do we? Maybe you do. I'm not big on it. No, I do it, and I, I would pray that in humility, I try and do that pretty regularly, very consistently. I try and think of other people, but sometimes I think about me. Anybody else in here think about you? I, I think about me because I like me. I want to please me. We go to a restaurant. I'm not thinking about what you want to eat. <laughs> Could you order for me? Forget that. <laughs> not happening. I go to Home Depot. Connie wants to go in the garden section. I'm like going to tools because that's where I want to go. She usually joins me in tools, by the way. She likes tools, too. But I think about me. I think about pleasing me. But if I really love other people, I start thinking about what's best for them. What can I do to make their life easier? How can I minister the love of God to them? I know greater passage that exists in all of Scripture is that passage there in Philippians 2. It shows this incredible picture of Jesus. Though he existed in form as God, didn't consider it robbery to become like us. You talk about thinking about somebody other than himself. God incarnate from heaven became one of us. You, you, you get the picture? I don't know if you've ever tried to imagine what, what God is like in heaven. Sometimes I, I, I like to think about, God, what do you actually look like? What's your day like? I can pretty much guarantee you we don't have a clue. All I know is Jesus had that in heaven and left it in heaven and came here. Why? Because he came not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me in a very personal way. That's why Ephesians 5 says, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as an offering and as a sweet fragrance, a sacrifice to God. Does that boggle your mind? It does me. That God in heaven left the glories of heaven and came to this wretched earth. Because let's face it, it is wretched. There's lots of neat things about it. But compared to heaven, it's like, eh. Not exactly the same, I'm thinking. There's no pain there. There's no sorrow there. There's fullness of joy there. There's the beauty of the Lord there. There's constant praise there. I'm pretty sure we don't have that here in the South Bay. And I'm grateful to be here. But this is not heaven. He left heaven. Willing to sacrifice for you and me. We should be willing to sacrifice for him. The duty of love. He talks about the law. He says you should not commit adultery or murder or steal or covet. If there's any other commandment, it's summed up. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the duty. That's the debt of love in action. That's it working out. That you know it and then you live it. See, it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to do something with it. Amen? There's a lot of things I know that I don't do anything with them. I know it means something to me when I do something about it. Amen? 
Men, let me help you understand that. Excuse me. I'm fighting off a cold, so. Thus far, the Lord has been gracious. It's your anniversary. You know it's your anniversary. You know you should go get a card. And flowers. And a present. And plan a weekend getaway. But you don't do any of those things. And instead you go home. It's our anniversary and I didn't do a thing. How much love do you think your wife is going to think you have for her? Zero. Why is that? Because real love is born out in action, amen? The card may be lame. She may actually be allergic to the flowers. She may hate the place that you're going. But because you did it, it says the world to her. It's in the doing that love is real. The duty of love is to live in love. Not talk about it. Not acknowledge that it exists. The duty of love, the debt of love worked out, is that something changes. Love like that's not going to rob other people of their lives, their living. Love like that is not going to harm them in any way, shape, or form. Love like that is not going to be focused on you. It's going to be focused on them. Love like that is tangible. It's such a great word, tangible. It means to be able to be touched, held, felt. You know, if you're married and you're in here, how would it be if your spouse says, I love you, but don't touch me. I love you, but I don't want to be in the same room with you. I love you, but I don't want to talk to you. Those of you that are unmarried, maybe you're dating, you, same applies to you. You're looking for a spouse. You're, you're not looking for someone who wants to be a hermit. Amen? You see, love is tangible, it's touchable, it's real. God wants us to be that kind of love in this world. Love the unlovable, touch the untouchable. It's what Jesus did, it's what we're to do. It's not some crazy psychological self-image, you know, I, well, I just love myself. You know, every human being has been designed by God to automatically love yourself. You love yourself. Come on, get over it. You do. You love yourself already. The question is, are you going to love other people the way you love yourself? That's why Paul used that analogy for marriage here in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave, him, gave his life for it. But he said, who among you does not love himself? It's a rhetorical question, by the way. It demands a negative answer. Well, of course I love myself. That's why you eat. That's why you sleep. That's why you don't get into car wrecks every day. You love yourself. The duty of love takes that love and transmit, uh, transmits it to other people. How does it get fulfilled as we close? You see, living in love and living by the law are not mutually exclusive. You understand what I said? You see, when people say, well, I don't have to live by the law anymore, that in and of itself is actually true because you are no longer under the law but under grace. Amen? But here's what happens if you actually live out the law or live out love. You're going to keep the law as well. That's what will happen. That's how it's going to work out in your life. You're not going to take other people's things. You're not going to steal their spouse. You're not going to covet what they have. You're going to love God supremely. You could take the Ten Commandments. You could take all 613 of the Levitical laws, throw them in there. 
You could throw everything that's in Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, all those things that we're not supposed to do. The outflow of the debt of love, the fulfillment of the debt of love, when you actually love like that, is you're going to look so much like Jesus that all of these things in Scripture that we're supposed to do and be is how you are going to do and be. That's what will happen. You see, when it's fulfilled, when you're really loving like Jesus loves, you're going to look like Scripture says you ought to look. You're going to stop lying. You're going to stop cheating. You're going to stop being bitter. You're going to stop being angry. You're going to be very forgiving. You're going to be humble. All those things that Scripture says should be the marks of, of who we are in Christ Jesus is actually the outflow of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. The debt that we have because our sin debt was paid has left us with another debt, which is a debt to God to be loving. And when that starts to work out, man, your life changes. That's when, you know, Jesus, when he spoke what we call the golden rule, however you want people to treat you, so also treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. When he said that, the backbone of that is fulfilled in love. When James says the, the royal law is loving your neighbor, loving God, loving your neighbor, the whole point of all of this is there's only one ingredient in both things. That's love. Love God. Love your neighbor. And both times, it is agapeo. Love them like Christ has loved you. Sacrificially. Beautifully. Wonderfully. Extravagantly. You ever thought about the extravagant love of God? How extravagant is His love? And He takes very simple things and does amazingly complex works with them. For those of you that are musicians in this room, you know that actually there are only seven notes. They can be in a whole bunch of different octaves and different steps and tempos and all kinds of things, but there are only seven notes. So when you watch Sound of Music, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do, that's all seven of them. Now think about how Handel and the Messiah arranged those seven notes over a whole bunch of octaves with half notes and half steps. Sustain. Or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Think about how those notes got arranged into these massive orchestral works. Beauty on beauty on beauty on beauty. There's one thing. It's love. And when you start to blend love with everything else, it turns into a Jesus symphony. It turns into something that's beyond beautiful. And it can be adapted endlessly. There's not a person in here who can't love. And I pray that we spend our entire lives trying to fulfill this one thing the debt of love. Amen? Would you stand? We're going to pray together. Worship team's going to come back up and we'll close in song. Think on it. Take it home with you. You owe God a debt. It's not the one that's going to save you. It's the debt because you're already saved. And that debt is to love one another. To love everyone as Christ has loved us. Father, thank you for the incredible power of your love. Lord, it was love that held you on the cross. It was love that allowed your blood to be shed in our place. It was love that sent you here in the first place. It's love that's redeemed us. It's love that transforms us. It's love that's authored truth into our lives. And we pray, God, tonight 
that you'd send us out of this place so filled with your love that indeed that promise that we are more than conquerors through him who loves us would enable us to love others like you do. Everywhere, at all times, help us to love, Lord. We bless your name. We ask all of this in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen.